This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. to welcome you to worship this morning at the Pluckerman Presbyterian Church. Uh, one of the things that's happening this morning that's a wee bit different from normal uh, is for the folks who live locally, uh, they will be getting together or they will have already gotten together, depending on when you happen to be watching this video, uh, at 845 uh, this particular Sunday morning. It's the first time we've tried to gather together for, for outdoor worship. It's going to be quite different from, um, from how we've, we've typically gathered, both in uh, our sanctuary and uh, in the context of our online worship. Uh, keep your eye on, uh, on, on, on our Facebook page to find out how things went uh, uh, as, we, as we gather together. Uh, for worship physically. One thing that's happening during that particular service that you will also have the opportunity to participate in is what's called our sensibility offering. This is something that we started at Pluckham and Presbyterian Church a number of years ago. Uh, everybody I, I, I had a soup can and that soup can was to be kept for, as an empty soup can, I mean you don't want to be using a full soup can, that just completely defeats the purpose. You need an empty soup can. So in other words, it's just a can, it's no longer a soup can. That can is to be used uh, to, to, to collect money, basically. Uh, you sit the can on your, your dinner table, and whenever you gather together for a meal, you put some money into that can. And, and, and the part of the philosophy behind that is to remind you, uh, to remind us, that um, how, how fortunate we are to have, to have plenty. And as we put our money into the can, it reminds us of folks that don't quite have as much as, as we have. And then once a month, what we've done is we've had, a, we've had an offering. We've, everyone's brought their cans in. We've collected the money. And we've sent that off to uh, Ekwendeni in Malawi. Uh, there's a school for uh, children who are hard of hearing. And that money's gone through the Presbyterian Church to support the work of that particular mission. Now, we're going to have the opportunity to hear a wee bit more about that from Paula Cooper, who is our mission partner there uh, in, in Central Africa. So um, I, I'm going to be putting together a video with Paula over the next few weeks, and that will very soon be available. But for those of you who are, are, are participating in our worship online, you can still uh, uh, take part in our sensibility offering. Uh, and, and even if you're local, uh, you, can, you can participate still in our sensibility offering without uh, necessarily bringing your soup can to the church. Uh, there is now on our Give Now page uh, a, 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 a link in the drop down that you can click on that will give you the opportunity to give directly to our sensibility offering which will help the children in Equindeni. Uh, also on our Give Now page there's the regular opportunity for you to give to support the continuing work of our church and to support our other mission partners as well. So for those of you that, that have been giving faithfully, thank you. Thank you so very much for doing that. I want to encourage you to keep on giving. Uh, those of you who have not taken the opportunity to give yet, again, there's no pressure to do so. We're so happy that you're here worshipping with us. But if you've not done that and would like to, uh, follow the link on our page and you'll have the opportunity uh, to give freely to the work of our church. I want to remind you that we're here for worship every Sunday morning. Uh, the, the video goes up around 6am and you can join in any time on Sunday and then any, any day after that, both on Facebook and on YouTube. So take, some, take just a minute, um, click to, to like, to subscribe, uh, to follow uh, our, our page or our channel and you can be kept up to date with everything that's going on in the life of our congregation. Well friends, it's a joy to be able to be here. Let's continue in our worship of God.
Today's scripture lesson is from John 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So one of the things that, that's that's been happening over the last few months as we've been dealing with this COVID thing that's been going on. Um, It it, it seems to be that that, that so many things are are, are changing. Uh, The way that we uh, interact with one another. I mean, we can't go out of the house now, can we? Unless we have one of these things. You know, I've always got one of these masks in my pocket. I know my kids, whenever they leave the house, I'm encouraging them to have a mask with them so that if we happen to go to a store or we happen to be around people, we've got to have a mask. That's something that's changed very, very significantly. Uh, we can't leave home without a mask. The way that we relate to one another, uh, we have to maintain a, a significant level of, of distance. Uh, the, way that we, the way that we do church. I mean, this is something that, that, that I don't think any, anybody at the Pluckerman Presbyterian Church at least imagined that we'd be, we'd be doing this full time. And this, just, just so you know, this is not something we are doing temporarily. This is something that uh, is a permanent change in the life of this congregation. Whenever we are able uh, to safely meet together for for worship uh, uh, physically, this is going to continue. Uh, We've been working hard to build build a community online. And for those of you who who are part of our, our, our online community, we are not going to leave you. Uh, uh, once we're back physically again, we are an online community. We are an online church as well as having a physical presence. So I don't want you to think that when we get back together again physically, this is all going to stop. We're together in this. And that's something that's changed. And I know that many churches are, 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 are thinking in terms of what that change looks like in their life and in their experience of being the church. So that's something that's very much at the at, at the forefront of what we're going through. So many things are changing, and that's that's really at the heart of the gospel. You know, for the church, when we think about the the message of the gospel, when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ and all that He has done and the impact that He has on the lives of His people, it's a life of transformation, isn't it? And one of the places where we see that transformation so very, very clearly uh, is is in John's Gospel. Uh, John happens to be one of my one of my favourite gospels. Uh, it was a it was a favourite gospel uh, in the in the Celtic Church, the the, the church, uh, the ancient church in Scotland and Ireland. John was one of the 
one of the one of the favourite saints, if you like, in uh, in the in the Celtic Church. Although Saint Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland, John's Gospel uh, is the is the preeminent gospel uh, in. In, in Scotland in so many ways and has been for so for so much time. Um, so the heart of John's gospel is this idea, uh, as it is in all the gospels, but at the heart of John's gospel is, is, is very clearly this idea of transformation. And we see that in a number of different ways in the lives of a number of different people. Uh, one thing about John's gospel is you have a, a number of different encounters that Jesus has with a variety of individuals. And when he encounters those individuals, um, they're changed. They're changed utterly. They, they're, they're never the same again. Something has changed drastically in their life and in their experience because of the encounter that they have with the Lord Jesus. Um, what we're going to do over the next few weeks is take some time to have a look at some of, of these encounters and think about some of the different people uh, that, 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 that Jesus met with uh, throughout John's Gospel and what happened to them, and the, the, the change that, that took place in their lives uh, when, uh, when they had encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. So today I, I want us to begin by thinking about this character that we find right at the beginning of John's Gospel, virtually at the, at, at, at right at the start. He's one of the very first people that, that, that we encounter, a very prominent uh, man in his society, uh, we've just read the passage about him from John chapter 3, a man called Nicodemus, uh, one, of the, the, uh, uh, one of the elite within his particular community. Nicodemus, uh, was, a, Nicodemus was, a, um, uh, was a Pharisee. Uh, there were only a, a certain number of Pharisees at any one time. They were an extremely elite body. It's, it's said that there were somewhere around 6,000 Pharisees, and that's all there ever were at any one time. So it sounds like a big number, but it's actually a relatively elite group. But when you break that down and think a little bit more about who Nicodemus was, we know also that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, he was a member of the Jewish ruling council, and there were only 70 members of that supreme court of, of the Jews. Uh, so he was one who was in the, in the high upper echelons and he had had to work very very hard to get to that place it was all done by hard work it was all done by learning it was all done um, because he had kept his 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 nose to the to the millstone to make sure that he got to that position that he was in he had studied he had worked he had played the game he had played the game right he had played the game well and he had achieved for himself that particular standing. So that's the first character that we find uh, encountering Jesus in John's Gospel. This man called Nicodemus, a man who was at the very top of his game in so many ways. And what we find is this man in, in, in the evening, at night, he comes to, to meet with Jesus. Now, the setting is important, isn't it? Setting's always important in, 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 in so many stories. It's very important in the Gospels. Uh, when someone comes at night, it means they come in the dark. So we know not only the, the, the time in which, at, at, at which Nicodemus came to Jesus, night time, but we also know the type of time Nicodemus came in the dark. He was in the dark. Uh, he was perhaps somewhat lost, even in the midst of of his, uh, his, his standing, even in the midst of all his studying, even in the midst of all his knowledge, he was a man who John tells us was coming to Jesus out of a place of lostness. He was coming to Jesus in the dark. So as a, as a, as, as a Pharisee, one of the things that we, that we need to recognise uh, about Nicodemus is that he is coming from a very particular perspective. And one of the first changes we see, or at least one of the first changes that Jesus encourages in the life of Nicodemus, is uh, that he needs to have a change of perspective. He needs to change his perspective. Um, Jesus essentially said to Nicodemus when Nicodemus uh, asked him the question, uh, Jesus essentially said, you've got to change the way that you see things 
if you want to understand the real nature of the kingdom of God. In other words, you've got to put on uh, new glasses. You've got to look at things very, very differently. These glasses help me to see. Uh, I'm looking at a screen right now as, as, as I'm recording this. And, and, and as soon as I take this off, all I see is, is, is a blur. Um, if I was in a room filled with people and I looked out across the room, I could tell there were people there. I could make out the shapes and the colours and I would have a very, very good idea of who was who and what was what, but I couldn't see them very clearly. I need to put on my glasses if I want to see things clearly. And there are times when, when these lenses will stop giving me the clarity that I need. There are time that there, there will come a time when my eyes will deteriorate and I, I won't be able to see as clearly. So I'm going to need to get new glasses at some point. There are, there are points in time where we need to change the way that we see things. The way that we see things is central to the way that we understand them. There was a man called uh, Viktor Frankl. Uh, he, was, uh, he was the founder of one of the schools of, of psychotherapy, uh, the, the, the school called Logotherapy. Uh, the, the idea behind Logotherapy was all about trying to discover meaning in, uh, in, 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 in life and come to a place of peace and a place of understanding as we discover our meaning in, in life. Uh, one story that he tells in one of his books is about a man whose, uh, whose wife and children uh, died in the, the, one of the Nazi uh, death camps. And this man's understanding was that his children, having gone through the suffering that they had gone through, and his wife, having gone through the suffering that she had gone through, would be in a particular uh, place uh, in glory, in heaven. And he, as a man who had not gone through that, would never, ever see them again. He'd never, ever be able to be in their, in their presence. And, and as he spoke about this to Frankel, one of the things that Frankel said was uh, that he needed to change the way that he was perceiving things. Because wasn't he also going through a particular type of suffering as he was mourning and he, as he was grieving the loss of his wife and of his children? And he was being purified as he went through that suffering. And that helped that man to put on new glasses. It helped that man to see things differently. It helped him to change his perspective. That's the first type of change that we see when we encounter Nicodemus. The second thing that we see when we encounter Nicodemus is that Jesus is, in, is encouraging him, is challenging him, uh, not just to have a change in perspective, but to have a change in status. Uh, he uses a very particular phrase. He says, you must be born again. You must be born again. Uh, the word that's used is a word anothen, A-N-O-T-H-E-N, anothen. And that word has three meanings. Very often in John's Gospel, words have multiple meanings. I, 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 and, and, and often you find that John means everything that a word can mean, right? So here you find this particular word. Uh, to be to be born again, it it can mean to be born first of all uh, in a totally new way, brand new, completely differently. Everything is changed utterly. It can also mean uh, simply again for a second time. It's a rebirth, but it's a it's a type of fresh start, if you will. And the third the third image is. Um, of being born from above. That's the third thing that this particular word can mean. And it, and, and, it, and, and it refers to a rebirth that is brought about by God himself, a birth from above. Um, when Nicodemus hears this, for some reason, for whatever reason, maybe it's in John's telling, maybe it's Nicodemus is just being obtuse, but for some reason Nicodemus decides he's going to understand this literally. And the whole idea of being born again, uh, just completely grosses him out. Uh, how can a man crawl back into his mother's womb to be born for a second time? It's a horrific image that that Nicodemus seems to, to grasp a hold of. And it's a, a little bit bizarre that he would go there uh, because the idea of a rebirth was not something that was unheard of in the ancient world. Uh, William Barclay talks about 
uh, in, in, one, in his commentary on John's Gospel, he talks about rebirth uh, and, and, and said it's something that was fairly, fairly common in the ancient world. Uh, he, he talks about when someone be, became a Jew, uh, when, uh, when someone converted into, into Judaism by prayer, by sacrifice and baptism, uh, it was said that they were reborn. They were born uh, uh, as, as if they were a brand new person. So it's not something that was unheard of. In many of the, the, um, the ancient mystery religions, uh, uh, rebirth was talked about quite, quite commonly. So I'm not entirely sure why uh, Nicodemus would go to the, the place of understanding it literally. But I think he goes there because it's easier to go there than to think about the implications. He was a man who had worked very, very hard to get to where he was. He had gone through all kinds of hoops. He had come to a, to, to a particular place of standing. And what, what needed to happen uh, uh, was for him to be born again, for him to become a brand new person. And essentially by saying you must be born again, it was saying all that you've worked for is worth naught. It's worth nothing. It's worth nothing. You've got to become like a child again. You've got to start from scratch. Everything that you have worked for, really, is getting you nowhere and will get... Oh, I'll give you standing in society. It'll make you look good. But standing before God, it means absolutely nothing. You must be born again. That's a challenge that comes to you and to me as well. For us to be made right with God, it involves a rebirth. We've got to be made new. And it's nothing that you do, it's nothing that I do. You can have whatever standing you like in, commun in the community. You can have whatever standing you like in the church. If you're the one that's worked to get there and you've done it only on your own merits and, and you've done it to make yourself look good and you hold that up, you've maybe served so many terms as, as, as an elder or as a deacon. You've maybe been a pastor for however many years. And you kind of hold that up as a, as, a, as a thing of pride and of significance. And that's the thing that's going to get you to be right with God. Well, there's a significant misunderstanding there, my dear friends. The only thing that's going to get you right with God is for you to be born again and for you to be made right with God through the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's the transformation that Jesus is talking about to Nicodemus. You must be born again. And then there's another change that, that Jesus speaks of, and it's, a, it's another utter transformation. Uh, it's a change of life. So we've had a change of perspective, and we've had a change of status, and, and, and finally we see a change of life. In this passage, there's, there's, the, 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 there's one of these linguistic um, plays on, on words. Um, you, in the... In the, in the Greek New Testament in the Hebrew Bible, uh, you find that there's a there, there there are two words that are used for for spirit in the in the Greek. It's pneuma, it's like pneumatic things like that. Okay, pneumatic tires. You know what they're filled with air. Um, th that's one of the words that's used for the spirit pneuma, and in the Hebrew Bible, the word that's used is ruach. That means spirit, but it also like pneuma refers to air. It refers to it refers to wind. Uh, and Jesus automatically starts doing this kind of play on words thing. When he's talking about the spirit, he also talks about, uh, he talks about the wind. Uh, and essentially he says, you've got to become like the wind. You can't see the wind. You can't see where it's coming from. You can't see where it's going. Now, Nicodemus had his life structured. Um, it was ordered. He had a faith and salvation, as I've already mentioned, that was based on his own efforts entirely. And it was all mapped out. Now here's the challenge. If you change your perspective by changing your status, then your life is going to be utterly transformed. You're no longer in control of your own destiny. That's the thing that's so important to grasp. You're no longer in control of your destiny. God is is in control. You don't earn it. It all comes entirely for God. From, it all comes entirely from God. God calls you to take risks of faith, trusting not in your own ability, but trusting 
entirely in him. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? Well, there's a verse that's a wee bit further on in John chapter 3. It's in John chapter 3 and verse 21. Let me read this to you. Whoever loves the truth, Jesus says, will come into the light, so that it may be plainly seen that what has been done has been done through God. So friends, God calls us to leave behind all our preconceived notions of who or, or what he is and to allow God to enter in and to transform us, to transform who we are from the very centre of our beings. He calls us to look at things through, through new glasses, to look at things with different eyes. He calls us to, to change our status and to put ourselves perhaps in positions that we'd rather not be in. You must be born again. And then he calls us to allow him, if you will, uh, through this change to so transform our lives that we may truly see with these fresh eyes and be able to enter into the kingdom that God has prepared for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join together in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you again for this opportunity to worship together this week, even if it's online. Bless those members of our congregation who attend the outdoor service today. I pray that they are able to feel the joy of congregation even from a distance. And bless all those watching this service today. They are just able to feel your joy and your presence and the presence of our church family. I want to lift up the people in Lebanon after the explosion a few days ago. Bless those who were injured and the families of those who were killed. And please bless the first responders and the medical personnel working hard to revive any survivors. I also want to lift up the people along the East Coast who were, hit, who were affected by the storm that recently hit. I know that some are still without power or AC or running water, so please just continue to give them some hope and let them feel your light. I pray for all of those who are suffering in our entire world as we continue in this pandemic. Just please help everyone to still feel safe and comforted and in your presence, even in a time of uncertainty. Thank you for your countless mercies and blessings as we go about our days. And I want to continue this prayer with the words your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For then is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain in your hearts forever. Amen. Thank you.